I'm going to call to order the uh, City Council Transportation, Energy, and Utilities Committee at 5:10. Um, and the first item on our agenda I, is the agenda. I was moved to adopt the agenda. I would second that. Um, any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of our agenda? Aye. Aye. Uh, second item on our agenda is adoption of the minutes from our 1219 meeting. I move that we adopt the minutes. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, and that brings us to the third item on our agenda, and why many people are here tonight is public forum. Um, so I guess I will go through the in person first, and then we'll move <coughs> on to. Um, virtual second. So the first person who signed up to speak is um, Kim Horning Marcy. Go ahead. Um, Happy New Year. And uh, thank you to the two members Absolutely. and staff for your service. Um, my name is Kim Horning Marcy and I'm active with the 350 Vermont Burlington Node, the 350 Clean Heat Study Group, and the Creation Care Task Force of the United Methodist Church of New England. I hope you will pass both proposals. I think they deal with different things. And I think they support each other and deal with different aspects of our challenges. I can see, because I've been at many meetings now, that the members of the City Council and TUC are all hardworking, and I do respect that. And I hope you will also seek to be known as council members who are respectful of your constituents and keen to empower them to have voice and vote when it is appropriate. And this is exactly that time. Please allow these votes to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Next is Luce Hillman. Hi, yes, Lou Selman. I'm Hi. with the University of Vermont. I'm the Executive Director of Facilities Management, and thank you for holding this meeting. We have been working diligently with the ED and also uh, the previous Ordinance Committee to work out a type of carbon impact fee, and we feel that it was approved in a very uh, good manner, and that there was a lot of public input, and we were very pleased with the results, which allowed buildings of 50,000 square feet also allowed us to maintain and keep 50% of the impact fee in order to reduce our own greenhouse gas emissions on campus, which we had diligently working for. And this was a bit of a surprise, very last minute, these two proposals. And we would like the opportunity to take the time to really evaluate these two proposals. We also feel that this is a huge administrative burden for both Public Works, uh, Chris Burns and BED and that having a smaller program will allow it to be developed, understand the administrative roles of the parties involved, and that way be successful. If we bite off too, more than we can chew, it's going to be a big struggle for us to implement this. And we are firmly committed to implementing a program, but we feel that program approved is the way that the university would like to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Peter McAuslin. Oh, I, I thought that was an attendance. Okay. Up. No, I, I have nothing to say. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. Um, thanks. It's Dave Kielty. Hi, uh, good evening. Thank you. My name is uh, Dave Kielty. I'm with the University of Vermont Health Network. The interim, I serve as the interim vice president for facilities planning and development. Um, I'm here tonight to speak on the information we're seeking from the ordinance that's proposed, the ballot initiative. Um, we're concerned about the, the process. Uh, we we thought this was. Uh, I don't want to use the word resolved. First, I would say we support every effort that we can come up with as a society to stop our dependence on fossil fuels. It's killing us, and uh, you can see that uh, everywhere. What our interest is is uh, trying to ensure that there's a path forward, a bridge to be able to do that. Is constructive and collaborative and so on. Um, so we're concerned about this particular ballot measure largely because of the, the changing nature of the proposal and how it's going to appear. We participated uh, 
with a great deal of enthusiasm from the last uh, version of the ordinance, the carbon fees, working with our partners at Burlington Ledger. Uh, we uh, did look at how this would impact our uh, Burlington Ledger district heating proposal for the medical center campus. And we do understand there's some controversy around biofuel, so we, we recognize that. However, uh, our thoughts were that that was a great opportunity to create a, a bridging uh, uh, resource for us. A hospital is different than residential, commercial, and even industrial uh, uses. We're very intensive in terms of needing uh, high uh, quality thermal energy. This is really related to the amount of air conditioning and ventilation we have to provide to make sure we have a safe patient care environment. In terms of number of air changes. So you can think of your house where you have a, a fuel system or a heating system and you're heating to, uh, for environmental uh, issues. But imagine if you were bringing in 20 different air changes, up to 20 air changes an hour, and you had to heat and treat that air to maintain comfort within your residence. That would basically indicate that you would have a need for fairly substantial thermal energy requirements well beyond what your house is equipped to provide. So we have to maintain that level of, of thermal uh, capacity. Now, we think in the future there will be technologies that will be able to harvest sustainable thermal energy. I mean, you can think of ground source uh, heat pumps, for example, uh, and other modalities that may not exist at this time. But we have a need for uh, high temperature thermal energy. The uh, proposals for carbon neutrality, I think are very noble in their cause. I mean, obviously we're gonna end up at some point with electrification and removal of fossil fuels uh, reliance. But in terms of our ability to shift from current reliance on thermal energy, whether it's uh, fossil fuels or biomass or biofuels, right now uh, the path <coughs> forward, the technologies to support that conversion just don't exist. Uh, the concept of electrification, which we think is good, but in working with Burlington Electric, I think they would also admit they don't have the capacity to support our thermal heating needs through electrification. Uh, it's just not doable at this juncture. What well, may be in the future, and a couple of thoughts about that. We buy all of our electricity from Burlington Electric, which is essentially a monopoly in the city of Burlington. We have no opportunity to go out and look at other uh, energy sources for electricity except the degree of reliance on Burlington Electric, which is provides great service and excellent uh, energy to us. But this ordinance with taking off the table some of the means that we would use to uh, thermally uh, provide thermal energy on the campus through electrification, for example, means that we have a sole source provider, and we're going to need a lot more and greater flexibility to take a look at all types of electric, electrical generation capacity, perhaps even creating our own utility uh, to, be able to, to be able to do that. So there's a lot of complex issues here, and we recognize that. But we felt that uh, where we left off with the carbon fee ordinance the way it stood, at least we had a path forward with some predictability that we could rely on to support our planning for the campus over the next 50 years. With the current state of the proposal, that predictability is gone. And we don't really understand how we're going to be approaching our future development needs on the campus, given the current regulatory uh, circumstances. So I just wanted to make sure we were clear on that. Uh, let to get to this. The blue set, you know, the proposal kind of just uh, modifications of that were just uh, authored and provided today or yesterday, which it makes it very difficult to understand how we could respond to that. Uh, our, again, our, term, our current infrastructure in the medical center, you know, we're trying to do with, and, and Burlington is, how do you recover from a century or more of bad decisions around energy? I mean, the investments in the last 100 years have been the traditional thermal uh, fossil fuel model, which we all agree is not where we need to be. 
But to reverse that is going to require collaboration, innovation, and working with our partners to figure out how do we get beyond where we are currently into a more sustainable future. Um, we supported the last version of the, uh, the ordinance proposal and still do. Uh, but the way that this current proposal uh, ordinance has been modified with two different ballot initiatives, we can't lend our support uh, to this. So I just wanted to be clear about that and thank you for your consideration. Um, thank, thank you, Dave. Um, next, we have Kelly Devine. Hi, I'm Kelly Devine. I'm the uh, executive director of the Burlington Business Association. I spoke to the committee last time. Uh, you know, uh, they mainly talked about having a better understanding of what section of our Burlington uh, community this impacts and what that looks like. So uh, I, could, I hope you think we've fulfilled the request of the committee to come up, work with BED to come up with a spreadsheet. Might be interested. Can I just read off a couple of the facts we found very quickly for the rest of the folks here that have This heard? is in the memo that you, you guys from the memo that you sent? Yeah. 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 So this material is also attached yeah. to the meeting for anybody who wants to review. So there were uh, for properties that were going to be greater than twenty five thousand but less than fifty thousand square feet, i.e. Uh, covered in the in the next phase of this, there were one hundred and twelve parcels that were identified. The funny thing about Burlington property is that Sometimes buildings are broken up, sometimes they're merged together. You can get sort of some stuff that you wouldn't expect. Uh, we found it interesting that of those 112, 72 of them are properties that are listed exempt from property tax. So that means they're either you know, owned by a nonprofit, some of them are up at the university, nine of them are going to the school district buildings, and then it includes things like the Flynn Theater and you know, some uh, community health center of Burlington, several of the churches. So that left us with some questions about how a carbon impact fee might might impact organizations like that that are listed on a nonprofit. That doesn't mean we don't think that we should move towards more efficiency. It's just how does that work when such a big subset of the cohort is, you know, small nonprofits, tax exempt organizations, school district. Um, of the remaining ones, 33 of them have some kind of small retail parcel in them. And I just want to like mention, we you know, had uh, testified that this could have unintended consequences on some of our smaller retail because business owners can pass these kind of fees onward. So, you know, some places we know, all know, like Peter and Earl's is a place that would be impacted, both of the city market buildings. Uh, the new cafe dim sum on St. Paul Street. Uh, these are all outlined in the spreadsheet that we provided. Citizen Cider, Kestrel Coffee, a couple of them are nursing homes, one of them is an elk sludge. So I think it's important to, if you're going to really be able to understand the potential impacts of something like this, is to understand the data set. So we got ourselves wrapped around that uh, pretty effectively, I think. Um, I have to agree with you know some of what I heard from the university and the medical center is that this did feel like sort of just came after we all did some important work on the piece that was passed and put, in, in, and put into effect last fall. Uh, I just want to say that I think uh, Burlington, especially the physical space in Burlington, is likely to go through a transition. People may not be aware, but a lot of our office space is vacant, and I know you talked about the potential for it to become residential property that opens up opportunities for uh, you know change of use which um, requires making those improvements a lot of the residential spaces are using electric heat right now um, so you know as we take a look at the, the Burlington inventory and try to figure out ways where we can achieve more of the goals that are important to the citizens and the, to the community you know I had offered up to Darren to you know, be a partner in that, try to figure some things out. I'm a big fan of, you know, envelope and weatherization. We have a historic code in place that sometimes makes that really challenging. So anyway, um, you know, I'm not uh, changing my position from last time necessarily in, in favor of this, but I do think that um, it's important to consider that we have some more work to do and um, maybe um, that this kind of proposal could be more impactful um, in both the short and long term with some more collaborative work on it. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. 
Next up, we have Chris Gish. Yeah, um, yeah I'm Chris Gish. Uh, I live in Ward 8 now. Uh, it's been a while since I was able to make it in person to one of the TUC meetings, but I wanted to just urge the TUC to pass the resolution today that would allow voters to vote on adding um, other polluting fuels to our existing thermal um, ordinance. And right now we have this kind of perverse situation where our carbon impact fee incentivizes switching from one polluting fuel to another, like namely switching off fossil fuels and switching on to biomass like biofuels or quote renewable gas. And that's just not necessary, doesn't make a lot of sense from an environmental perspective. Like we know all those fuels have greenhouse gas emissions roughly equivalent to the fossil fuels they would replace on a life cycle basis. And they also have a lot of secondary environmental effects that are specific for each one. And so that's a really easy near-term change that can be made. It'd be easy for the voters to understand, easy to make progress on. So I support the spirit of both resolutions that um, were drafted and you have today. I think my sense is that the one that would only change, only add these other polluting fuels to the ordinance would be the most straightforward one. And we've heard from you know, some of our big institutions in town that some of this feels confusing. And I think that is not very confusing or unpredictable thing to wrap our head around. It's just kind of like even the playing field and do an environmentally sensible thing that all the science is behind. And there are other ways that Burlington can make further progress on like our decarbonization goals. But I think this is a really um, sensible, straightforward, near-term step. And then I'd also just remind, I'm sure the two knows, but like this isn't the end of the public process. This is if there's ballot and it's the very beginning, like this, if you pass the resolution, would go to the full council. There's room for a lot more input. Then it would go to every voter would have input on it. Then it would go probably back to a committee, then back to the council. You know, it's a long process. So I don't think, um, especially a simple ordinance like the one that would go on the March or a simple resolution, excuse me, I don't think it's um, too much to ask. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Next up, please. Natalie Brown. Yes, that's me. I, I knew you were struggling to read the handwriting. Um, my name is Natalie Brown, and I am a psychologist from the Burlington School District. So um, I'm here on behalf of my students, who are numerous, and also the highest risk students in the district. Could you speak uh, up a little bit, please? Sure. Thank yeah, you. I'm here on behalf of my, my students. Um, who are numerous, but also on behalf really of all of the students in the district. And I believe that two things are gained from allowing, uh, again, thinking through my students' eyes. And we talked about this, my students and I have. Two things are gained by allowing the public at large to vote on these two proposals, at a minimum, the first one, but ideally both. And one is, it's a model for the very best that democracy has to offer. And we really need to see every example of that that we can um, at this time in our nation. Uh, and the, kid, the students are aware, if, if not of this particular issue, of what, we're, what we are facing as a nation. So the model for allowing the public to speak, take it, continuing to take input is a, is a wonderful thing. The second thing that's gained, though, and, and that's really what's being spoken to primarily, I would say, by the folks in 350 Vermont, other climate organizations, is that it is also a major step towards securing the healthiest possible future for the students, for us, and for the students at Vermont. So, thank you. Thank you, Natalie. The next is uh, Dylan Giamatisa. Yeah, good evening. Uh, hope everyone's doing well. Drive safe tonight. Um, I'm Dylan Giamatisa. I'm the Director of Public Affairs with BGS. It's Vermont Gas. And uh, as we've presented information in past uh, meetings, we're focused on trying to figure out ways to reduce emissions in line with state requirements. The Global Warming Solutions Act, which requires going out a little bit to 2030, a 40% reduction 
the greenhouse gas emissions off of the 1990 baseline and an 80 percent reduction by 2050. That is our focus. It is our North Star. And it's the mandate that the state now has to do that. We don't get a free pass. No one gets a free pass in that work. Uh, throughout this particular process, though, going to Burlington, um, we tried to share feedback uh, as to what is in the interest of our customers. You've heard from some of them tonight, the larger customers for whom uh, this would uh, impact the way that they make energy choices. Um, and of course, back in December, uh, our president and CEO, Neil Lunderville, uh, paid a virtual visit to the committee and provided some feedback on the proposal. And at that time, he said, we were surprised that we were back in this committee talking about a proposal that the council had just advanced in November. That process came after months of committee work, both in Tuke and in the Ordinance Committee, and we welcomed the opportunity to weigh in. But of course, before that, there was also months of deliberation with stakeholders, with the interested parties that would be uh, impacted with BED and others, uh, in consideration given to the full facts of what this is, what's happening uh, statewide, and how the city might be a partner in this work. Um, we did not like all aspects of the first carbon fee proposal. In fact, two years ago, I gave testimony in the General Assembly when a charter change proposal was moving through the process in which I noted my concern that this could uh, create more costs over and above those that are already going to happen as thermal sector transformation take hold, takes hold, whether that be for gas customers or other thermal users. Um, we're just very sensitive to cost, and, and we know for a fact our customers are as well. They want to take part in this transformation, but they want it to be affordable, cost-effective, and achieve real greenhouse gas reductions, because that's what we need to do under the state mandates. Um, with regard to where we are now, I mean, it, it, it is kind of heavy language here, but it's a little frustrating. It feels like a bait and switch. There was a process, the council acted, and now there's talk about changing the parameters once more. Now, instead of chasing one ball of policy, we've got two proposals on the table. We've got two potential votes. And so as we assess that, it's challenging because at the statewide level, we have the Affordable Heat Act. Others have mentioned it, Act 18. That regulatory process is underway. I've responded to two comment filings for that this week. I've got another on Friday. I've got another next Tuesday and another following that Friday. We have a lot of work going on at the state level where all of this is organized. And as we think about that North Star, the process to get there, and the life cycle analysis scoring process for all these fuels, the state law included those fuels which are now being considered uh, to be removed from an exemption to the March ballot question because they're under review, because they are shown both through national uh, models such as re to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the only fuels that would be permitted under this policy or at the state level would be those that result in actual greenhouse gas emissions reduction, something that we need to achieve the statewide mandates under the Global Warming Solutions Act. So my question would just be, is, as we look at these proposals, are these being brought to the committee uh, in an effort to figure out, is there a performance standard structure or a structure with flexibility that can serve customer needs? Or is what we're looking at here something that's about banning thermal choices for customers? Those are two very different discussions. And I think that the voters, if they're going to weigh in on this through a ballot item, should be presented with something that's crystal clear about the intent of the proposal. Um, finally, I'll just say that additional steps to make a carbon fee more rigorous um, is really inadvisable at this time. It eliminates customer options. But the notion that this somehow uh, having very limited, narrowed exemptions for very specific purposes with large customers is somehow incentivizing use of those fuels, I mean, it simply is not the case. You already have a primary renewable energy ordinance. We have a, a carbon fee proposal now. There's an additional permitting step that was put into the carbon fee proposal adopted in November such that you need to attest as to why you are not using an electrification, geothermal uh, option, things of that nature. Um, so this is not an incentive. It's a very narrow carve out for the, re the, the reality that large commercial and industrial customers have very unique needs. So I would encourage you uh, not to support uh, moving forward with these proposals. You've taken a meaningful step. We want to continue to be partners in it. And as we look to the future, the Affordable Heat Act is happening statewide. We're all mandated under the Global Warming Solutions Act. That's going to be the North Star that drives climate uh, action. Right now, I think Burlington has done enough. And my request would be you put your pencils down and let's talk about what we can do at the statewide level. So I'll leave my comments there. Thank you, Governor. Uh, and last in person, we have mid-percent here. Thank you. 
I support the resolution calling for a ballot question on town meeting day, which would ask the voters whether the authorized extension of the carbon pollution impact fee to non-fossil fuel thermal energy systems and fuels that emit greenhouse gases. Those include advanced wood heating, renewable gas, and liquid biofuels. The rationale for extending the fee in this way is laid out in the resolution. Doing so would eliminate or reduce incentive for these systems and fuels, which threaten to impede the city's ability to achieve greater greenhouse gas emissions through use of electrification, geothermal, and solar measures. This absolutely is creating incentives for use of these polluting fuels. When you impose a fee on use of natural gas, but not on advanced wood heating or renewable gas, that is an incentive. In addition, eliminating these incentives, in addition to eliminating these incentives, <coughs> Extending the fee to these measures would allow the city's program to be more consistent with the state's program under the clean heat standard. That program is going to result in a sliding scale of credits based on the relative greenhouse gas emissions of various measures. What the city has now is an all or nothing approach which is completely incompatible with what the state is designing. So the city, we would like the voters to give the city authority to tweak the existing fee for these reasons. I believe we're ready to move forward with the resolution on this limited issue without additional process because these issues have been dealt with at length in the hearings that have been held to date. Prior to the adoption of the ordinance, two held three meetings, and the ordinance committee held three meetings. And at those meetings, the public presented extensive, detailed scientific information about the greenhouse gas emissions from these fuels. And that's all you need to know about them. They emit greenhouse gases, so they should be subject to the fee. If you disagree and think that more process is needed, then, and you want to consider the approach of the second resolution, which calls for additional study with a ballot measure this fall, if you want to go that approach, and I suggest that you limit um, that resolution to consideration of adding these fuels to the fee and not add on the additional issues of whether to extend the fee to additional buildings or whether to increase the magnitude of the fee. We've heard from the business community that they're strongly opposed to those measures. Um, I think that we need to fix the uh, fees structure and eliminate the incentives that I discussed before we talk about extending the fee. Um, finally, um, we heard from the hospital about um, its concern with uncertainty and with technologies not being available. Technologies exist today, um, including thermal energy networks, which could tap waste heat and geothermal energy. Um, we presented the hospital with a conceptual report by an expert, Jared Rodriguez, offered to talk to them about it. They wouldn't even talk to us about it. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think we're turning to the online participants now. Um, anyone online can use the raise hand function to speak for public comment. Um, the first up is Jason Van Reich. 
Go ahead, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, members of the TUC. Um, this is Jason Van Dreisch. I live on Caroline Street in the south end of Burlington. Um, and I am here to speak on the question of the um, two ballot measures that you're being asked to vote on today. Um, I appreciate, although I certainly don't understand the complexities of uh, the issues that the hospital and the university and Vermont Gas are dealing with. Um, but I think the key issue here is that th they are bringing those concerns to you at the wrong time. The question right now is not whether anything listed in these ballot measures actually becomes official city policy. The question before you and the question that you're voting on is does the city want to hear what voters think? Neither of these ballot questions are binding. They're both advisory. And once we hear from citizens on these two, one in March and one in August, that's the time when the hospital and other interests really need to weigh in on an equal footing with the citizens of this city. What I see right now is an attempt to short circuit that process of people actually getting to weigh in on a critical question. And I strongly encourage you to vote in favor of both of these ordinance, uh, both, sorry, both of these ballot measures, because they're what'll give us uh, a, a level playing field for the citizens of Burlington to get to have an equal say in this critical issue, along with the experts and the special interests who have a perspective that's a very valid perspective, but it should not cut off the opportunity for the citizens of Burlington to also get to weigh in. So please vote for both of these resolutions now, and then let's debate the merits once we've heard from the people of Burlington how we all think about these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Next up is Ashley Adams. Go ahead, Ashley. Hi, hi there. Thank you for taking my um, comment. I'm a Burlington resident. I'm a mom and I hold a master's in public administration. I've been running a manufacturing business for over 25 years. And I'm deeply concerned about salvaging a habitable climate for humans and all species. In my small business and other properties, I've made meaningful investments in reducing carbon pollution, including a 20,000 square foot solar array, which generates enough power to sell the excess and, and lots of other projects as well. Um, we're exceeding planetary boundaries, and yet many of our leaders are really content to declare a climate emergency and then continue to legislate like it's 1984. And I know we can do better here in Burlington. We must do better. Today, I'm here to ask you to simply take the first step in cleaning up the mess that was made when the thermal energy ordinance passed in November. That flawed ordinance imposed a fee on fossil fuels and it gave other polluting carbon emitting sources of energy a pass. While counselors were considering the ordinance, they were provided with research briefs with the latest science demonstrating the perils of incentivizing the combustion of so-called advanced wood heat, so-called renewable natural gas or methane, biodiesel, and so forth. Not imposing a fee on these polluting fuel sources incentivizes their use, and that's outrageous. I urge you to allow a ballot question simply asking voters to decide whether to authorize the city council to impose a fee on non-fossil fuel heating systems in fuels that emit greenhouse gases. Residents who passed ballot question two, which led to the new thermal heating, or excuse me, thermal energy ordinance, deserve a chance to allow the city to shut down the incentives that undermine the stated goal of the ordinance, which was to reduce greenhouse gas pollution. Thank you for taking my comment and I appreciate you considering this. Thanks, Ashley. Jack Hansen. Go ahead, Jack. We can't hear you, Jack. You might be muted. You are muted, it looks like. Should we come back? Yeah, we'll come back to you, Jack. Greg Hancock. Who is it? Greg Hancock. Go ahead, Greg. Yes, hi. Thank you for taking my call. 
Um, I'm calling because I want to first thank the Tuke for all the work they've done on uh, on on considering and drafting these proposals, and um, and to strongly ask that they please permit the ballot question that allows voters to authorize city council to impose carbon pollution impact on non-fossil fuels to advance. Um, this is really a matter of greenhouse gases, not just a source of fuel, but the greenhouse gases that are put into our atmosphere and are causing um, global warming um, and an increased pollution in the city. And we don't want these fuels exempt um, or have any kind of loophole that allows them to be incentivized, as others have pointed out. Um, so I really want to encourage the, the, at least the first resolution, the simpler one, which just um, advances the, um, the proposal to go out to the voters of Burlington on the March ballot to include the non-fossil that the uh, the non-fossil fuel uh, and heating systems and fuel sources that are are um, right now uh, given a free pass. So thank you for taking my uh, call and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Greg. Um, we'll go back to Jack and see if we can hear him now. Go ahead, Jack. You can unmute yourself. Still muted. He did send me a message to let me know um, the Zoom lagged, but he was here. Um, what's that? Jack typed in the chat to say his Zoom lagged, but um, he is here. Is it, is it working now? Yeah, there you are. Okay, it always lags right when I get unmuted, which is very unfortunate. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm Jack Hansen. Uh, I run an organization called Run on Climate that works nationally on municipal level climate policy. And we've worked on uh, building decarbonization policies in a number of cities across the country. I think Burlington has an opportunity to um, be a leader in this space and, and, and join a cohort of communities that have started to address uh, emissions from existing buildings. The ordinance that was passed in November, I think, took a very small step in that direction. Uh, it, it addresses a pretty narrow set of circumstances when, you know, a very large building, the, the 80 largest buildings in the city, when a very large building is installing a new system, it encourages them to install a um, less polluting system. Although, as folks have mentioned, that it's it's there are flaws even in that goal. But, you know, even if the ordinance functions perfectly, it's it's going to address a few buildings a year um, that are that are getting a new system. When what we need is and what we committed to in 2019 as a city is actually decarbonizing all buildings and actually eliminating fossil fuel use and emissions from the entire building sector. Um, we declared that in 2019 as the net zero energy roadmap because of the climate emergency and the need to do this quickly. Here we are in 2024, um, you know, over, over four years later, and we've made very little progress. If you look at the latest data, we have not made uh, very much progress at all in reducing emissions from buildings. So I don't understand why people are surprised that we are trying to craft further policy. I think it's very clear that it's necessary to do so, and it's completely in line with the city's um, goals that we passed, um, I believe, 11 to 1 in, in 2019 that have broad support from this community. So, of course, we're going to continue to craft climate policy um, and I hope that folks will join in that conversation and and really engage from a perspective of how do we go about it rather than a perspective of let's just pause and not do anything for the time being um, because we've already done enough, which is what, you know, we've heard from from some folks. 
So this this proposal um, uh, from that Gene has introduced is really to continue that conversation and spend the next few months working together, talking to stakeholders, and ultimately trying to get something in front of uh, all of all of the voters and, and get something in front of the community around moving forward and continuing to try to deal with this existential threat and crisis that we really have to deal with. So please continue this process and this conversation. The community is really relying on you as leaders to, to continue this really critical work. We can't turn our back on it. If you have other paths forward that you want to take, please introduce those as amendments or as ideas. But to simply kill this and try to walk away from the issue of the climate crisis is in my mind, not an option at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Sandy Hemberger. Sandy, go ahead. Go ahead, Sandy. You look to be unmuted. We can't hear. I guess we'll come back to you, Sandy. Liz Curry. Go ahead, Liz. Thanks. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, I'm I'm here to just talk about the um, the ordinance. I didn't have a lot of time to read it. I'm sorry. I just learned about the meeting tonight. But I just want to share that like making good climate policy is really important to understand there's policy and then there's implementation. And the this policy has great goals. We all want to be there. Personally, my personal feeling is I'm also suspicious of biofuels in many cases. But for example, advanced wood heat is you know, means different things. There's advanced wood heat for heating buildings. There's bio wood biomass for electricity. Those are two different things. Advanced wood heat is 30% of the buildings in Vermont use advanced wood heat. And, it, and there are very good reasons based on science and technology to continue using advanced wood heat in our transition to, an, to electrification. Um, I just want to share that making good climate policy means that there has to be implementation and you know maybe we haven't seen a lot of progress on um, emissions reduction in Burlington because implementation has not been where it should be and I as much as I love my municipal utility which is owned by the ratepayers it's not a monopoly it's our municipal service um as much as I love the municipal utility we have, I can also find fault with our utility for not advancing implementation more aggressively. And, you know, I worked um, with some really brilliant people. I think one of them is, is in the room. If Elizabeth Pelchek is there, I see you, hi. Um, I worked with a lot of brilliant people at the EIC who are some of Vermont's most strident climate activists and advocates. And they will tell you that, and I learned that policy is great, but it's really the engineers and the maintenance workers and the technicians and the tradespeople that have to implement policy. And those systems are not where they should be to achieve the goals of this ordinance. And because of that, you're going to see a, a serious misalignment between implementation and policy that's going to hurt a lot of people. I mean, even nonprofits that are planning to build like the food shelf are going to be hurt by this ordinance. So I think it's great to ask the public to weigh in, but you're asking a generally uninformed public to weigh in on something that's very complex and relies on the science of engineering and a lot of data that got mis construed, misrepresented, and conflated during the McNeil District Energy um, conversation. And if we're going to have a just transition, which we need, you can put a lot of words on paper and we can advocate for a lot of things, but that doesn't mean you can actually implement them. So I would encourage the public policymakers in the room to not approach this in a piecemeal fashion, but to actually be more aggressive about having our municipality, our municipal utility lead 
more public forums, more conversations with trusted advisors who are neutral parties with science and engineering backgrounds to explain that the implementation of these goals is not feasible based on the technology we have right now. We are going to need backup heat for the next couple of decades because we don't have battery storage available at scale at the institutional level. That is not really debatable, not because I'm saying it, but because all of the like brilliant energy engineers and scientists in Vermont will tell you that. So without that backup heat, we can't achieve these goals. Personally, I act, I have a lot of suspicion of liquid biofuels. That's very worth a conversation, you know, um, but there are people like Matt Napolitan, who's your constituent, Councillor Bergman, who will tell you that there are new sources of um, biofuels like switchgrass, which can be burned at a plant like McNeil once the technology is developed, once they're at scale, that do not emit. And so, you know, this ordinance, I believe, is premature because of that, because there's just not enough good science and data and engineering information on your table in front of you with trusted advisors who can actually help you understand the <laughs> consequences of this. And by the way, if you're going to get the public opinion, I think that's great, but this ordinance is so specific. This is not what should be going to the public. This is like, you've got fee structures in there. So if you're just looking for public opinion, then craft a broad public policy statement that allows the voters to actually understand the issue that they're voting on and not, you know, based on not bank their decision based on fear mongering with inaccurate information. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, Catherine Bach. Go ahead, Catherine. Woo. I'm Catherine Bach. I'm calling in from California where I'm visiting my brother who lives out in the forest and burns wood. And we've been having a lot of discussions about wood and whether or not he should use his gas heat and he doesn't want to. And so I haven't even won that little conversation in my own family. But I think that we all in this room and probably in the world agree that we need to achieve real greenhouse gas reduction. I've heard many people say it today. I've also heard a lot of the things I was gonna say being said. So I just like to say that, first of all, the one question I really have is how is a fee on only fossil fuels not incentivizing other carbon emitting fuels so i don't i don't, I don't understand that and i do think it's a really good idea to have a ballot question that allows voters to weigh in even if it's difficult to understand but the question of whether or not to put a fee on non-fossil fuels that emit greenhouse gases is not that difficult to understand. So I support permitting that ballot question. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. iPhone Laura. iPhone Laura. Go ahead and please state your name for the record. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, I'm Laura Simon. I do not live in Burlington. I worked for the city of Burlington for 14 years. Um, these past 10 or 20 years, I've been working on climate issues. And to shorten my piece, I will say that I support what Nick and Ashley and Greg have said and others. Um, part of how I got involved in this is I, I live close to Dartmouth College and they were considering a biomass plant. And we gathered scientific uh, letters from hundreds of scientists and it led Dartmouth to say they were not going to turn over into um, biomass energy and uh, heating. And um, I suggest that you um, pass tonight the simple um, proposal uh, for the ballot to impose I, uh, impact fee on non-fossil fuel energy and possibly after that continue to work together on um, what more further steps the city can take. Thank you. 
Thanks, Laura. Do we have anybody left, Mandy? No. And we lost that earlier commenter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anybody else in the room who has not spoken or signed up for public comment that wants to speak at the public forum? Nobody? Seeing none, we will go ahead and close public forum. Thank you for, thank you to all our commenters. Um, and then we move on to our deliberative agenda, and we just have one item on that agenda, and that's the discussion of the carbon pollution impact fee that everybody's been commenting on. So um, I guess I will kick it off by um, turning it over to other committee members for uh, discussion. I know that we have some material that has been uh, provided, so I'll yeah, turn to Jane. Let me start. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I know, first of all, <coughs> I've been pretty good when I'm not talking. Which, but I'm, I've had a six week uh, serious cough thing, which is really stinks. May you not get it. Um, <coughs> so, with that uh, as a, a preface, um, I'm going to appreciate both of my colleagues as well as Maddie, as staff person, and everybody else. Kelly and Darren, and, and everybody who decided that this was important enough that we could uh, meet soon enough to have a, um, a discussion and a decision in time to get something if it is chosen to be there on the ballot or not. So first, I just wanna thank you all for participating and for, um, for the scheduling. <coughs> um, I think that um, from my perspective, I have heard the process questions. I have heard the um, the uncertainty positions that have happened. I've even heard, believe it or not, the how could you do this to us? We just with this is settled business. I, I, I that's something. All of those things um, I've taken very seriously, as seriously as I've taken the um, the emergency. We will see an example of it tonight, right? The windstorm tonight is going to show us another example of why we need to get a handle of it. Um, we um, and I and both of the points, both of the resolutions that I have submitted to the agenda that I'm going to try to move to figure out how we can actually move them are are based on um, hearing a lot of that, but also hearing the need to continue this essential work that we're doing um, to, um, to the, ex the greatest extent possible in the soonest amount of time to um, eliminate or, or greatly reduce emissions. As a result, although I have heard the, um, the argument, the complaint, that said, well, what we did was settled, so we should just let the state um, process work out. Due respect to GM, GV, GVS, mm -hmm. thank you, GVS. Um, I, as a person who um, uh, who didn't support that in this committee, didn't support it at the council, <coughs> let the ordinance committee do its thing, but it was clear where I was. Um, I, I don't see that as being settled. And I don't think that anybody should think that the conditions in the world are going to allow anything to be quote unquote truly settled. Um, I mean, that's a gr gross overstatement. But I think, unless you're going to twist my words, that you know what I mean. There, we're going to have to continue this process over and over again until we get to the emissions reductions that are going to allow this planet from heating, I don't know, over the two degrees Celsius that we're looking at right now. So with all that soapboxing um, behind me, I have, we, we've crafted, and I've not done it by myself, so I thank the people that uh, helped great. Um, two different resolutions. One for a March ballot item 
This is the uh, one that was labeled town meeting day. Uh, it's one nine twenty four revised town meeting day resolution. Um, it's the one that many people have focused on here in the comment. Um, and then another one on the really the resolution that brought us here, which was the, looking at a different number of uh, or a subset of buildings, sizes of buildings, looking at a different fee structure, um, as well as looking at all the fuels, not just fossil fuels. And let me, I don't know how you want to approach it. So I have tried to break these things apart and you will see different time frames with them and, and processes for them. Um, my memo gives a, <coughs> a very general um, reasoning behind it and, be and would be interested that I don't want to monopolize um, the time to go into uh, in to why I think that um, it addresses um, the substantive concerns that are out there that I find to be valid um, and um, and compelling. So, how would you like me to proceed? Would you like me to try to introduce as a, a motion um, both of them for a serial consideration? I'd like to hear from. Okay. So anyway, I'm, I'm well, and we'll see how she would like. Totally. So so that's so you know I'm I'm open to trying to to do that. We have two that are in the public record and um i would like personally for us to consider both of them is a is a single entity here no I, i'd like to take them up individually let's do that way. i mean if you're amenable i think that. that's great yeah okay. um so both of these are i mean do you want me to do okay. wait do you want no well oh, so i move to introduce the the one nine 21 revised um, TMD 24 carbon uh, fee ballot item resolution. Um, these act as a package as a substitute of the uh, the original one that was referred to the committee. Though. That's the way they are. So I would move the introduction of this for our consideration. Uh, so that's been moved. Second that. And it's been seconded. Um, so do we want to go to discussion next? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let me let me be brief so that y'all can, can talk. Um, there was a um, there is a concern. I think I heard this tonight that um, District uh, Energy at McNeil um, may be subject to a fee if. Uh, we move in this direction and this resolution on lines 95 and 96 make i think it make it clear that it's not intended to authorize the city to impose a carbon pollution impact fee on the mcneil district energy project um i would say that while i believe that it is implicit in this because voters are going to vote on the language itself if the, there was a sentiment that that be turned into a, um, a provision of the ballot measure, say on line 116, where we would go, uh, this ballot item, uh, we would say is, is not, we would just add like from line 95, this ballot item is not intended to authorize the city to impose a carbon pollution impact fee on the McNeil District Energy Project. So I would be open to making that if there was felt that that was necessary. Um, I gotta correct what a couple of people have said. Um, what would go on the, on the ballot is not an ordinance. We are not talking about an ordinance. And other people have said that, but let me just be, because it obviously didn't sink in. This is just an authorization, and it's an authorization for ceilings up to, well, starting at up to 150 per ton. So there is a, um, there are ways that we can, 
deal with a fee. I think that it is what Nick said regarding the um, the state affordable heat act. We're going to be able to to structure this in a way that matches the uh, the actual emissions impacts of a variety of fuels, and that includes if there is none, not um, not um, imposing a, a a fee at all. Um, the uh, the other thing that this does, and that somebody mentioned their support of the prior one, is providing existing building payers um, the 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 opportunity to use funds that are generated to um, do emissions reductions projects at their buildings and facilities. So that is included in this. It was not included in the resolution that I had put forward um, as far as I can recall. And um, I think that um, I might have been, but at any rate, it is included in, in this one. I think it's important that we use available money to, uh, to help people um, make the transition that, uh, that, we're, that we need to make. Um, and uh, I think that uh, I'll end there with just saying, I think it closes a loophole and, it, and that loophole in the original um, ballot authorization then impacted the, the debate that we had uh, at our committee. You know, you weren't allowed to impose a fee on that. Then you've got to go through this other more complicated thing. Well, we'll wait for the state to deal with it. That I hear was more complicated, was was raised uh, particularly with the ordinance committee. Um, I felt that it was an overlay to our deliberations. And um, this would close that. Thank you for listening for all this time. Did you didn't cough. I didn't cough. No, this say. could be that the end of my sickness, which would mean that I'm not infecting you all, I don't think, <laughs> which would be good. I didn't have any temperature today. Yeah. Um, I think that I'll end up speaking longer later, but I will just say it now. <coughs> I will be supporting this. Um, so I guess that brings us to me. Um, it should be no surprise, I have concerns. Um, I did not support the referral of this, uh, the original resolution to committee. Um, and my concerns then were that we had just passed on November 20th, I think, uh, an ordinance that we haven't even really had an effect yet. And um, I would really like to see for new construction um, and buildings over 50,000 square feet to see that ordinance work for some period of time and then have a review of that ordinance and how it's worked before we iterate and then, um, you know, uh, make changes to it. Um, <coughs> you know, I do say the decar decarbonization of buildings, um, but I do think we need to give some um, so predictability and some stability to those that are um, bearing the burden of our policy decisions. So in the case of UVM and UVMMC, who um, spent a lot of time um, as stakeholders in the conversations leading up to the, uh, the ordinance creation process, as, as Nick pointed out, we had three tooth meetings and then three ordinance meetings after the stakeholder engagement, we came up with an ordinance <coughs> Um, that was that was a significant step forward in my view. Um, some talk about loopholes, but I mean those were deci conscious decisions. They weren't like they were they weren't loopholes, um, and that those were intended to be in the ordinance because there was reasons to have them in there. Those those other fuels, um, mostly of, around our alignment with uh, state policy. Um, so I will, I can't support this, um, and that should be no surprise to my colleagues, but, um, I would like, and we haven't heard from, uh, General <coughs> Springer, and I'd like, and he doesn't know I'm going to ask him this, but I'd like you to sort of offer some, 
um, comments if you're willing to do so on um, whether um, on, on your, if you have concerns or if you support this resolution. We have not, we have not spoken about that, so. I, I appreciate it. Um, uh, we have the same concerns that I think we expressed at council during the referral discussion. Um, I don't think there's really a, a, a particular substantive change. I think this has just been broken into two pieces. Um, I would go back for anybody who's who's looking at it go all the way back to the 2019 net zero roadmap, which we have <coughs> developed along with Synapse Energy Economics. Um, speaks very specifically to the idea that we want to electrify, but we also need district heat. We also need renewable natural gas. It's right there in print. And that's the document that the city adopted by that 11 to 1 vote back in 2019. When we developed the current ordinance, um, DED and the Department of Permitting came to the council to seek permission to put an item on the town meeting day ballot. And we were very clear that we wanted a broad suite of renewable compliance options. And the council voted to approve putting that on the ballot. It wasn't a loophole was an intentional choice. Um, the ballot was placed, the voters approved it, and the ordinance was passed. The idea here is we support electrification. We are the electric company. We count on that as our future business model uh, for uh, the ability to grow our sales and be a sustainable enterprise for the city. But we know from real world experience that electrification doesn't work in every instance, that there are, particularly for existing buildings, a lot of distribution networks that are not compatible with electrification or geothermal at this point in time. And so having these different options was really critical to making the policy practical and affordable. You know, the charter change refers to the carbon fee as an alternative compliance mechanism. It's not intended to be a tax. It's not intended to raise revenue. It's intended to be uh, an alternative if somebody cannot comply. And the more compliance options we can give, the more likely they are to comply. And I would also argue that it is not, uh, you know, it is not accurate to say that because something has emissions at some point in the process that we can put this type of definition on it. The state and every other entity that looks at these questions uses life cycle emissions analysis. That means we have to look at all the inputs and everything involved to come up with a number. And so you can pick a point in time with a number of resources and say it's not carbon beneficial, but we have to look at the life cycle. Um, this is going to put us at odds with state policy in that regard, uh, potentially. So we have really significant concerns about this, not to mention the process. I'm trying to speak to the substance um, process concerns aside. Um, I don't believe this will help in our efforts to provide compliance options. I don't think it, it aligns us well with the state. Um, and then as we go towards the conversation on going to the 25,000 square foot and up buildings, um, and, and I appreciate working with Kelly to try to figure out who those buildings are. Um, I have really deep concerns about applying a carbon fee to those buildings. Um, if we think that this is a good tool in the toolbox for new construction, I agree with that. Uh, if we think it's a good tool in the toolbox for um, large existing buildings where we have entities that are doing capital planning, you know, 15 years out, 20 years out, I agree with that as well. Um, I think that that was the idea here was when we look at the large existing buildings, 50,000 square feet and up, we're talking primarily about Champlain College, the city, the school district, UVM, UVM Medical, a few other large entities as well. These are institutions that can make planning decisions. If we put a carbon fee in place, they can plan around it if it's predictable. Um, if there's stability around it, they can plan around it. And I think that that is a good way to go. If we're talking about a coffee shop downtown or a restaurant in the Old North End, they have nowhere near the level of capital planning capacity uh, that a UVM or a UVM medical has. And that's the difference between 25,000 and 50,000 square feet. So I'm not convinced that's the right policy tool. We haven't been given the opportunity to even study it um, and do the type of process with the stakeholders to engage with them and learn what we don't know, which we had the first time. Um, and I think it's possible that it may be that it's not a carbon fee. Uh, that's the right tool, but it may be something else. It may not even be policy. It may be different incentive programs, for example. Maybe uh, we're not reaching them the way we need to. So I think presupposing that we need to apply the fee and draft the ballot question for those buildings is the wrong approach in my view. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to make those comments. Uh, always respect the desire to make progress on climate, but we see this uh, approach as not being the right approach. Um. Okay. 
Um, a couple of, uh, of responses. Um, this ballot item on the agenda and the resolution that we're talking about now doesn't change the ordinance. And in fact, it invites us to really be looking at how it's working and reviewing that. So there, what it does do is if we, <coughs> in the course of this review, say we, we find some things pretty quick it, uh, around fossil, non-fossil fuel um, sort of systems that are um, emitting greenhouse gases, we know the, the list, that we would have already gotten the voter authorization to be able to deal with that. So this allows that deliberative process to occur the way that people want to do it and the way that can reflect the, um, uh, the review and uh, the analysis of how the existing ordinance work. So again, we cannot conflate an ordinance with a ballot authorization. All this does is um, allow us to move in a direction if the voters say so. And I just want to say, with regard to the council voting, I, I wouldn't hear on the council in 2019. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I can't speak to that, but I was here when we put it on the ballot last time. I heard all of the problems that people were raising and why and them telling me to vote no. And I did not vote no. I didn't vote no because I said that I thought that we could come back, that let us do that. And then we come back if we need to come back. And I was convinced in the adoption process and I am convinced now that we need to go back. Throwing the baby out with the bathwater was not a good idea then, but not tending to the baby when we have tending to do is not acceptable either. So um, I sort of, I, I, I don't buy that uh, from a process standpoint being used against bringing this to the voters now. Um, and again, in, in looking at all of the substantive arguments that I heard um, just raised, uh, by, I think he's my, I, I consider him a friend, Darren. Uh, he's not happy with me now, hasn't been for a little bit. He was more happy with me the, the last time uh, we had a big uh, issue. Um, I, I, I don't think that this takes anything away and is not in contradiction. In fact, he caught himself in saying potentially in conflict with state law. All right, this is what this allows us to do, is to bring that state law into these deliberation. I argue that we shouldn't be doing blind exemptions because the state law, which we're, we're saying we have to rely on, isn't in place and won't be in place until it's voted on in January of 2025. So um, I sort of feel that the state law is being used as a shield and a sword, and I always object to, uh, to the use of that. Um, and we can deal with, this, with the substantive arguments on the second uh, um, resolution. But I think uh, voters, Jason, I think was really eloquent in it. We should let the voters take a, a look at this. It's very clear that this is for non-fossil fuels. And um, we should have that. And again, I would be open if there was a feeling that this was not protective enough of the district heat, which I voted in favor of, and I'm not trying to backdoor, um, you know, change that vote. You all know me. I'll do something straightforward. I will not do it in a backdoor kind of way. So, um, I am open to that. If that is a substantive question that um, folks uh, think makes this objection, well, otherwise, 
if I don't hear that we should be adding that to it, then I got to say that if it comes up at the, the council or it's raised, otherwise it's it's just a red herring because we had a chance to fix it and we didn't decide that it shouldn't be. We, we decided that it should be fixed. So um, that's enough. Um, I, I guess I would say that we shouldn't, and I think if we ask the voters for authority, we should be doing it when we expect to be using that authority. So even though it isn't an ordinance, I think that the, the signal we were giving to those who might be affected by a policy that we would create um, is that um, we intend to use that authority. And I think that even us raising the, this um, now, so soon after we just passed an ordinance um, and had all the process leading up to the passage of that ordinance has created um, uncertainty um, and doubt on, on the part of, we know UVMMC um, and UVM, and they've, they've weighed in on this. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's settled, but I am saying it's, it's, it's settled for some period of time if it's, you know, the, during which we would evaluate how the policy is working and review it. I don't think it's a finished product. I support car decarbonizations. I look forward to our discussions on the, on the next resolution because I have some thoughts there as well. But um, we, have, we have to be mindful of the effects of the policies we're making on, on, on those they affect. Um, and, and I think uh, several commenters spoke about that uh, earlier. So I'll just, I'll just leave my comments there. Anybody else want to talk more? Go ahead. Ahan. I mean, I will just say, like, we don't have time to just say that it's settled for right now. Like, we can recognize the amount of work that went into passing the policy that we just passed, but the argument that just because we just passed something that we somehow, like, fulfilled our climate policy quota for the year and we can settle down and move on. I just don't think that's an appropriate argument to make in, in a discussion like this. I just don't really buy that. So, my only comment. Okay. Well, we have a motion in a second, and I think our discussion's over. Now. I think so. We could so we go, to, go to the vote. Um, all those in favor of uh, the motion, which um, is to move uh, the town meeting day 2024 carbon pollution impact to valid question. So I think that the one that I. Um, this is, no, no, this is, uh, this is the one. It's the one that's that was on the it's on our agenda titled 1924 revised TMD 24 carbon fee ballot item resolution. Yep. So that's, that's that's the one. That's the one. Um, all those in favor of moving that to the council? There's two against one. So that passes. Thank you. I'm often on the other. I'm the one. I or two. So. <laughs> it's a risk of the uh, other process, right? You know, it's when you when have three people. There's three people. Yeah, that's the idea. That's the idea. The idea is. Uh, um, so, um, with that vote, we'll move on to the next. Uh, yes. Do you want to move? To the next? <coughs> and this one is entitled "One Nine Twenty Four Amended Resolution Implementation of a Carbon Pollution Impact Fee for New Construction and Large Existing Buildings and Industrial Buildings, Twenty Five Thousand Square Feet." I think it probably goes to fifty thousand. It was too long a title. And so this recognizes the feeling <coughs> that um, uh, what I have heard um, are process complaints and attempts to deal with it, although it does not do it for an endless period of time, um, but seeks simply to refer back to the council the um, you know a resolution that would then have them refer back to this committee um, 
the um, the task of drafting ballot language in terms of the authority to, to authorize the implementation of a, a fee for a larger set of Burlington buildings. So it does not specify it in a, a number to uh, the authority to increase the fee above what is currently authorized. It does not set a number and the authority to apply <coughs> the fee to any source of emissions that causes global warming um, with the same uses that we've got right now. Um, the, the one that the one use that is different from the ballot item of 2023 um, is taken out the electrification of the city's fleet. And that is based on the conversations that we had in, in two and that we adopted <coughs> as part of the um, uh, part of the ordinance. Uh, it calls for a public process that includes a whole list of people, everybody who is in this room who's speaking, among others, is you know is is in one of the groups. So uh, the idea is to um, include y'all, um, and uh, maybe I overspoke in terms of VGS, but uh, you're invited to, Dylan. So, uh, and uh, of course, um, and the, the big issue is to try to get it back for May 20, uh, 2024. Um, I would just say that if we're going to do this in time to be able to get on the August 30, on August 13th ballot, which was an item, which was a possibility that was posed when the arguments were made against um, the prior ordinance, not the one that we've just passed out, but the one that was going to be much more comprehensive. And they said, well, we have these other elections in, um, in we have one for the primary, we have one for the general, so August and November. So um, this targets that. I would say that um, the uh, and, and end with, in terms of these dates, this will be um, something that necessarily is um, going to be practical. Has to, you know, match the work that was done, and no. Um, no lesser um, item than the uh, Joint Committee's work on police oversight, where we had a June deadline and we ended up giving back a product in December. And we informed people, but sometimes that happens. And But the fact that we had to meet a June deadline was important for us to um, to, to, to understand and to try to meet. So I, I, I say that not to give away that that period of time, but just to, to say that I personally am um, realistic in terms of the work that can be done and also the work that we are asking our committee and all of the, the people who have to interact with it um, to do. Um, it's befitting of a uh, of an emergency, and I thank the chair for, for for really taking that to heart. That this is very very important. Uh, I think uh, unless yeah, I I, I think that that, that, that doesn't. So thank you. Make a motion, and I would move the introduction of. And just a note: the title should be changed to remove twenty five. Oh yeah. Oh, let us do that. Let's make a let's make the motion that just um, cuts this uh, uh, off after impact fee. We'll just make it really short. Are you second that? So we have uh, a motion and a second. Um, and then we can do some additional discussion. Yeah, so um, thanks to everyone who spoke tonight and reached out about the topic prior. 
I look forward to all of the dialogue that I know we'll have over the next couple of weeks and hopefully next couple of months. I will just largely share my support for the last amendment and current amendment and what that support is rooted in. Um, a few folks spoke about it, but I just want to reiterate that this is a first step. I think this opens up the ability for us to have more conversation at a council level, which I feel is critical and is important to most issues and most policy. I represent a large number of young people, the largest community of young people in the city, and specifically young folk and activists reach out to me daily to share their deep concerns and anxieties about the climate crisis. I'm the youngest serving, serving person on the city council, and ultimately they are the ones that elected me to represent them. And so I have really tried to center myself in that in the last couple of months, and I feel as though I owe it to them to do whatever I can, whenever I can, to push climate action forward. And so that's why I voted the way that I did tonight, and I'm looking forward to continuing the work with the full council. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so on, on this resolution, um, I uh, share some concern around presupposing that the way to best decarbonize um, this, net, this other subset of buildings, um, 25,000 to 50,000 square feet, um, I share some concern that a carbon impact fee is the way way to do that. I'm not I'm not saying it might not be, but I am saying that I think we need a lot more process. We um, with the list that was provided by uh, by Jim Springer and, and um, Kelly Devine at BBA. Um, you know there there are there are questions about the ability of of those building owners to. Um, to absorb an impact be um, and whether you know and there may be other ways um weatherization and, um, efficiency of incentives to to allow us to decarbonize those classes of buildings so as i was when i offered amendments to the resolution that came to um this committee um that were rejected at the council level um I, I'm open to continuing a process to talk about decarbonizing those that subset of buildings, 25 to 50,000 square feet, but I'm not um, supportive of us immediately assuming it's going to be um, a carbon pollution impact. So I, I, I'm not I'm not sure if there's a way to square this. Um, I was looking at the language that I had. Um, offered as a um, as an amendment um, to the resolution that came to the council. Um, I don't know if you have that. I have it here. But um, that language, which um, would request BED and the you know, uh, permitting inspections to conduct a policy re review of how to best improve the climate climate policies. Um, already adopted by the council, including carbon pollution impact fee ordinance that we passed on the 20th of November. Um, and, it, and, and it also outlined a process um, that said that we would, uh, the review shall include, but be, not be limited to, um, a review of Burlington's carbon fee and to the extent at which it is in alignment with the current social costs of carbon in use by the Vermont Climate Council. And regulatory agencies. Um, an assessment um, of the extent to which Burlington's carbon fee policy should be extended to existing buildings between 25,000 and 49,999. Um, and an update on the relevant work taking place under the State of Vermont's Affordable Heat Act. Um, and I think an update on any similar climate policies established by Burlington surrounding communities. And so that's the that's the process that I could still be committed to supporting. Um, I'm not sure if it goes far enough for um, for the maker. It does not. Although if we do not prevail 
um, at the council. If I do not prevail at the council, I will not ignore any opportunity to do okay. the work that needs to be done. Well, right, and you do know that, and, and that's and been consistent. And I will pledge that that this offer sort of remains on the table. Uh, this is this is good for our children's children's children. Um, yeah. Um, personally, um, I, I, I think that this review, although it does, um, speak to a fee, um, does allow for it with the uses of the, of the loans of the fee, uh, Many of the things that you were talking to, not least of which is weatherization, which is included in that. Um, and um, I think that the, 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 the process will be, in, you know, could be an interesting thing. That one of the differences between this and yours is that this sets this. Um, with the two and sets it with the two to try to get city council um, um, uh, action and everything that you are suggesting uh, actually BED could do right now. I mean, we can't without the council require them to do that. And even then, that often isn't something that happens. But um, so, you know, these reviews, I think, should and can be conducted um, administratively. But um, this public process, I think, will give us a uh, give us a real opportunity to delve into the bigger subset of buildings and to do it in um, I will admit a, a more measured way than the um, than the first proposal. So I, I see uh, when Kelly talked, and I thought that was great, you know, about the number of um, exempt buildings that are there. They have unique challenges. I would be interested. I the type is really small. It's great, I, you know, to, to blow it all up to. To go through all five pages like that it was it was good um a lot of information there but i know that the, the uu is doing an amazing job yeah. in, in, a, in a historic building i think that it is decarbonized uh, or perhaps or mostly decarbonized with that solar array and is yeah. is uh, heating uh three other buildings as well as the uh, the meeting house um, but there was a real commitment of which I was a, a part of there to, to make that happen. And not every other place has that capacity. So I think that we, this allows us to engage with them. And, um, I look, I look forward to that because that's what it's going to be all about. If I may, I'm going to. Um, also ask uh, General Andrew Springer another question that he doesn't know I'm going to ask him, but um, <coughs> um, the date that is in the last resolve clause of this resolution is to uh, come back to the City Council um, no later than its May 20th, 2024 meeting. Is that, is that date seem like a reasonable amount of time to, um, or I guess, oh, let me rephrase it, um, you know, what sort of um, public process could be run in that amount of time? Um, well, I can speak to, you know, we, we had a process, we have an example, because in May of 2022, uh, then Councillor Hansen did a resolution that tasked BED with doing a number of the things that you just laid out um, relative to the current policy. We reported to the council uh, interim basis in July of that year and in December had a final report. So we had seven months of process, roughly. Um, we were required by the council to hold a public forum, uh, to engage with stakeholders, to go visit with every MPA and share our ideas. 
We engaged in multiple rounds of discussions with the Building Electrification Institute. We met with the District 2030 members, which represent buildings within the city that are seeking to decarbonize on an aggressive time frame and are committed to doing that voluntarily and have a lot of expertise. We learned a lot of things about our assumptions, myself, Jen, and Chris, about what we thought might work and what might not work. Um, that was a seven month process that we led with the Department of Permitting and Inspections. Um, this is obviously uh, proposed to be led by the two. So um, it really is up to the committee, you know, what level of process you would wanna have. We wouldn't be in charge of this one and um, it wouldn't be uh, the same process that I think was outlined initially. But it would certainly be dependent on um, the expertise in DEP and in uh, Department of Permanent Inspection. So, um, thank you. I, it looks like an aggressive timeline to me. And that's sort of what I was sort of getting at. Yeah, this I, 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 I raised that off, uh, you know, right at the outset. I, I, I understand that. Yeah. And I will be open to um, if good work is being done to extending that because the idea is to. To get a product that is um, as good and fair, um, so that we can get as much buy-in as possible, because that is actually a um, a big piece of what we have to do. So um, I, re I recognize that until the, the times get close, and uh, I, I think it, it puts our nose to the grindstone. Fair enough. So if I could just raise one other item just from BED. Um, our capacity in this specific time frame is going to be challenged in a couple different ways. Uh, this overlaps almost identically with the legislative session, and there is a significant bill uh, updating the state's renewable energy standard that we were engaged with as a legislative working group member. And the testimony is starting on Thursday. And a number of the same people who would be involved in this type of work are going to be involved in that work. Um, so we're going to be a little challenged in that regard. And we also have quite a bit of work that's been laid on us uh, through the district energy resolution. Um, so I, in, in addition to whatever differences there may be between the processes, I just wanna be uh, upfront and realistic about BED's capacity to engage um, in, in doing the things that we did last time over this type of time frame. Um, but I, I also understand and respect that we're not actually being asked to do that, but this is the two is running process. So. I just want to be clear that we may not be able to offer the same level of resource that we've offered in the past. Okay. Darren, um, is any of the, the work that you're going to be doing down at the state um, have um, a bearing on um, what we're looking at here? No. Okay. Different uh, yeah. policy. Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess we can go to a vote. I'll have a motion in the side band. Um, all those in favor? Aye. All I opposed. Um, but open to further conversations depending on how this uh, sugars off. Thank you. And I guess that what I would like is for, and I, I, I think it's in, implicit that it go on the, the 16th, which would mean us um, Sending this to and I, I mean, sending this to the city attorney and uh, Lori. The, these resolutions, I, I, it would be <coughs> best if it came from uh, yeah, from staff as a, as um, at, with the the Tukes, uh, Did you ask? I have not asked uh, Council President Paul. I did not. I I did not presuppose, presuppose. that. Uh, any action okay. uh, tonight, but we can do that tonight. Yep. And, uh, I can send it as well. That would be great. I think that uh, Joel's saying that because so, something's going to be in the, the, work, the, the deadlines of that. So that means that we've completed our uh, delivery yeah. um, we, uh, we have on here councilor items. Do councilors have any items? Um, our next meeting is on the 23rd still. Yes, and I just wanted to note that the Lincoln Bridge, I, or the, there's a Lincoln Bridge meeting that night. Um, I think that starts at 6. I can, okay. Um, so if we do have to that night, we'll just want to be monitoring some people 
So should we um do we want to move it um up a little bit to make sure we can time wise? Yeah, time wise. So we move it. I would suggest we move it to four thirty or four thirty. That's doable for folks. Uh, the yeah, this is what I got. You got a bunch of stuff right here. Yeah, no, but we just have it. Here it is, you got it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're, we would change this to what time? Um, I'm suggesting we could change, we'd want to move it up. I, I could move it as early as 4, but 4.30 maybe would be just a half. I could do 4.30. Yeah, I could do 4.30. Yeah, okay, let's, um, let's move our meeting on the 23rd to 4th if staff can support us. Then. Yes. How come my phone is not that in the interface? I will have to confirm um, that we can have the meeting space okay. at that time, but it shouldn't be a problem. But okay. I can follow up offline. I just wanted to. It's just... been kind of fun moving around yeah. different places. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you, everybody. Without any further business, I will adjourn us at, at 651. 651. Good job.